Welcome to our Love to Tell a Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Ralph Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. This is the podcast for November 13th, 2022. And uh, the, the focus of the text is the prophet Micah. Uh, for sure, we assign Micah 5, 2 through 5a, and 6 through 6a, which are the most uh, well-known of Micah's prophecies. Uh, the first one is about uh, the Messiah being born in Bethlehem. The second one is the famous line, do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. But uh, you might also consider adding Micah 1, 3 through 5, uh, where Micah says very famously, um, is, is not the transgression of Jacob is it not Samaria? And what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? That Micah is the first prophet to um, announce that eventually Jerusalem would fall. It's interesting because next week we have a contemporary of Micah, uh, the prophet Isaiah, who, uh, who at the same time was saying that Jerusalem was going to be spared for that time. Uh, what's interesting to think about is Micah lives out in the country. He lives out in flyover country, whereas Isaiah lives in the city on the mountaintop in Jerusalem. And when there is a war, um, Assyria comes, and we'll have this text next week, and devastates all of Judah, including where Micah's from, and, Jer and Jerusalem is spared. But the devastation that the leadership caused to the rest of the country uh, is well documented. So Micah, speaking from that perspective, is quite negative about the leadership, uh, both spiritual and political, of the people during his time, which I think sets up well um, the two uh, the two sections. Um, maybe we should start with the more famous one, Micah six six through eight. So yeah, I think. I remember you saying one time, Ralph, that this, this is the uh, text that if you don't know anything else from the Old Testament, you may know this one, or for the, for the liberal mainline Protestants, anyway. Yeah, the I used to joke with my students that um, the denomination that you and I are part of, Catherine, has a rule that you can't they can't publish any document with it unless it cites Micah six eight at least once. <laughs> And students would believe me. I mean, I would say it seriously, and they would like, "Really? Is that true?" Um, it is beautiful. I, think, I mean, you, yeah, it's gorgeous, right? What does what does the Lord require of you? Or to start with verse six: With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Well, that's that's a reasonable one, right? I mean, the temple is full of burnt offerings, calves a year old. But then the hyperbole, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000s of rivers of oil, right? That kind of hyperbole. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? Well, we know the answer to that because, of course, uh, elsewhere the prophets um, uh, vehemently uh, condemn child sacrifice and in the Torah as well, notwithstanding the sacrifice of Isaac, which doesn't actually... I mean, you know, it, God doesn't want the sacrifice of Isaac. So, uh, so you know, will the Lord require, does the Lord want all of this? No, he has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. The justice and kindness, I was just looking it up in the Hebrew just to be sure I, uh, I was sure. Uh, just to be sure that I was right about the Hebrew words, but these are both really big words uh, in in the Old Testament, right? Justice, mishpat, uh, can be translated either justice or judgment. Here, probably justice, to do mishpat, to do according to God's will for the world, to to do to to act justly, and to love kindness in the Hebrew chesed, my favorite Hebrew word. You have to get your phlegm up, right, to, to <laughs> say it, uh, or your German chesed, <laughs> right? The uh, love in action or covenant love or um, uh, mercy, it's sometimes translated, or loving kindness. To, so, you, so you do mishpat, you do justice, you love 
covenant law. You 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 act uh, justly, uh, and you and you. Uh, you love not just as a as an emotion, but as action, right? Love as a verb, uh, to love chesed, to love kindness, and then to walk humbly with your God. So there's reason that it's that it's uh, that it's a well known verse, but maybe sometimes overused. Can, can we go back though to that progression uh, yeah. that starts with the highest offering as, as the initial um, whole burnt offering, then. 10,000, uh, excuse me, thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil, hyperbole, and then the most ridiculous thing, child sacrifice. And that's what Judas kings were doing mm. during yeah. Micah's life. Exactly. So if you, you can go back to 1 Kings 16, King Ahaz, and it says he even made his son pass through the fire according to the abominable practices of the nations. Um, that is... Pastor, that, that's a euphemism for child sacrifice. And other kings were doing it in Israel and in surrounding um, uh, places also. So the hyperbole builds up through the impossible to the ridiculous, and then they were doing it. So that so it's in the midst of that, that, that this call. And one detail I like about it is he has told you, mortal, what is good. That is, you already know the law. This is all in Deuteronomy. Just go back to Deuteronomy, read that, and you know what to do and not to do. Yeah, good and in, point. And, and I, I really appreciate that because this uh, is uh, the actions that we do that are our own marking of our righteousness, which in fact do not follow what God has asked for. And what God has asked for in this covenant, and we've been talking about covenant this year, in this covenant is to practice justice, uh, to favor mercy, and to live in a way that God is glorified. I, I like to say it that way because um, in all of our lifting up, or I should say at least um, among um my uh, progressive uh, uh, United Methodist colleagues in our lifting up of justice and kindness, we forget that at the end, this is to bring forth the name of God, to bear witness to God, what, what our task as humans are. And, and so to live in such a way that God is named, that God is glorified. And if you think about the uh, battles that Israel has won in the past, um, the way that they are described by their enemies is not that their enemies are afraid of Israel, but that they are afraid of their God. It is an acknowledgement that there is a God in Israel. And all of these sacrifices, all of this um, worship, is not bringing glory to God. And the, the law is live in a way that practices righteousness, that extends grace to the community, stranger and neighbor, and God will be glorified. That's a real countercultural statement then, and it makes that text an ouch now, without it sounding like one of those, um, oh, it's just that mark, you know, that we've got it needle pointed and we've got to say it on every document that comes out of our denomination. I like that, by the way. <laughs> you know, I, I, this is one of those, the word humble, it's, um, I think it's a word that only occurs once in the um, Old Testament. It, it might occur also in uh, the disputed books of the Old Testament or the so-called Apocrypha. Um, it's The meaning is not agreed upon, um, but I think it probably means deliberate. Walk deliberately or intentionally with your God. Are, and, so, and so here's the call with all those things that you've just said, Joy. Do, are you walking daily deliberately? with God. And um, 
what does that mean? Well, it does mean to be humble about it uh, because it's not us, it's God who's great. And it means, I think, also to be able to uh, accept God's guidance, to be able to follow where God is leading, and to accept forgiveness. Yeah, what that's does it helpful. mean to Thanks you God. all to to walk daily with God? That and, uh, to lift up so that God isn't made known. Uh, but I really appreciate that. There's, um, I think it was Gene Lowry that talked. Uh, he received uh, some. Uh, recognition. And he talked about how just our definition of the word humble is actually um, confused because they say, you know, I'm, I'm humble to receive this. And actually, the, the literal translation means I expected so much more. And this is all I get. <laughs> and that's not how we use, you know, to be humbled. We, 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 we mean it to say, oh, this really you know, makes me feel good. But the literal meaning is I, I I got myself in this place of honor and you just brought me down to this one. So it's a similar kind of thing in terms of deliberately walking before God. Um, is our worship, our, our acts of ritual to make people look at us and say, oh, look how righteous, how just, how good, we are, or are they intentional signs that there is a God who is great and who is worthy of our praise? I think we- uh, Amen. We, yeah, amen. Go ahead, Catherine. Well, I just think we probably should talk a bit about uh, chapter five, since that's yes. one of the texts as well. This is uh, either the best known or the second best known uh, text in- um, in Micah. And by the way, I like I like that translation of intentionally, like- as we go about our daily lives, right? Not just Sunday mornings or whatever, you know, are we, are we, does our faith, does our walk with God, in fact, affect, do we affect what we do, affect uh, how we live our days? Anyway, chapter the five. With, the problem with Deuteronomy uh, or with the, with the, the law is that it's not something that you can do in 58 minutes once a week. Exactly. There right. you go. Right, right. So uh, chapter five, but you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. So we're not quite in Advent. This is the text, a text we usually hear in Advent, uh, but, but certainly uh, it's just a few weeks away. And so uh, this, I think one thing I would say about this, and again, it's a very well-known text, maybe even too well-known, but um, I would say it, it captures something that we mentioned for last week of the, um, uh, you know, that, that God uses the, the least and the last and the lowly uh, to bring about God's purposes, to speak God's word. So Bethlehem, not Jerusalem, right, but Bethlehem, this small village uh, outside of uh, seven miles or so from Jerusalem, uh, from, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to rule in Israel. Now, of course, People think of David or probably, you know, Micah uh, is referring to David or referring to a Davidic king, a descendant of David. But he writes more than he knows, uh, of course, because this becomes one of those messianic texts, uh, one of those texts understood as as uh, as foretelling uh, the birth of the Messiah. Uh, and we can't help but hear it, of course, uh, as as a prophecy of Jesus. And I, I think this goes also to how Rolf all opened us in terms of recognizing the the difference between the city uh, and the outlying areas and uh, the the promise that is made to the lineage of David, um, which winds up being in this outlying area, um, which is consistent with the story of the least and the last. <laughs> 